All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Trimmed and Burning Bible Study. Uh, tonight we are going to be in 1 Samuel 27, continuing on uh, where we left off uh, in our Bible study. And we'll just do a very quick recap like I usually do. This one a little bit more brief, um, but we will dive into uh, something from the past here. Uh, we'll get started. But of course, just a reminder, we're in the history books. We're moving along now uh, in the book of Samuel, which remember, this is first and second Samuel for our understanding, but it really used to be just one scroll of Samuel. Just like Kings and Chronicles were one scroll. But when you read these, you know, when you get to the end of 1 Samuel, beginning of 2 Samuel, you can see why it kind of got split here. Uh, but it doesn't really matter either way. But now we're into the kingdom years, right? We have transferred from Samuel, who was the last judge, the first prophet, and now we're going to have the first king, right? So, so it's the transitional period to the kingdom, the monarchy. And that's what we've been kind of looking at in this book here. So where we're at, again... Like I said, the book starts with Eli and Samuel, but they've since gone. They're dead now, uh, as far as you know, our part of the story and where we're at now. And just to recap, Saul, again, he's tried to kill David, and we've seen it over and over. Um, but it really took a turn here. The fugitive years of David really begin after that last spear throwing in 1 Samuel 19. And he went and ran. Uh, remember he told Jonathan chapter 20. They made, you know, Jonathan warns David that Saul really is trying to kill him, and David was pretty certain. Um, and then, remember, after that, David fl was fleeing. Uh, he went to the priest at Nob. Remember, he lied uh, to the priest there, Ahimelech, Ahimelech and uh, ended up getting him killed later. <clears throat> but later on in that chapter, he fleed to Gath. And I usually don't do this, but I want to go back right now. We're just going to read these verses. Let's go back to 1 Samuel 21, 10 to 15. And we're going to read this just because it's going to be really important for tonight. Just to remember what happened here. We talked about, this is the part, remember, where David kind of went crazy uh, but remember, he's on the run from Saul here, and he doesn't know where to go. He's not in Israel anymore. He has to run all over the place, and he runs here to Gath. And Gath, remember, this is where Goliath is from, by the way. So keep that in mind. So just these verses 10 to 15 here, it says, And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see this man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? So... I just want to recap, as we're going through a recap, that was just, I wanted you to get a clear picture of remembering what happened, because that's going to come into play later tonight. Remember, this is the one time, the only time I know where somebody pretends to be crazy in the Bible to get away with the scheme. I might miss one, I don't know, but David looks like, you know, he's pretend to be a crazy guy, and I talked about when we went over this in review, how they didn't have photo ID licenses, they didn't have social media, they couldn't text people pictures of who people were. So you just had to hear, you had to assume this might be David, but you couldn't be sure because there's no photo ID, right? So he played the fool, acting crazy. Doug's he's scratching into the posts. Back then, there was a lot of madmen. You can tell in Gath, a lot of you know, quote unquote, crazy people is what they would have probably called him back then, and I called him a madman. And he played it off like that and got away because David was kind of afraid. Remember, at this point, that Akish was catching on. So that's why I kind of want to review that um, as we go, and we're going to see those patterns. Remember these patterns in the Bible over and over. You can see the patterns spiraling around in First Samuel here alone. And then remember right after this, that's when David went to the cave of Adullam. This is where he got his 400 men, which later turned into 600 men. So he, he got to do uh, some recruiting here. And these were ragtag soldiers. They weren't in the army of Israel. They didn't really maybe have much training. So David was basically going to be their trainer and leader. And then because where Adullam was, and we looked, we'll have that map up again and again, but where Adullam was right above Kyla, Kyla was under attack by the Philistines, which... That's where he just, remember when he ran to Gath? That was the land of the Philistines. That was the land of the enemy. And then they came to attack Kyla. So David, like the true king at heart he was, defended him, even though it wasn't his job. It was Saul's job. And he did that. And then, of course, we learned about Saul pursued David instead of the Philistines because Saul is all about himself. And David's his enemy because because Saul is the most important thing to himself. And he's jealous of David. And he's been chasing him down. And remember, he went into that cave just by coincidence, right? There's no such thing as coincidence. God ordains everything. And this is a really good obvious picture. He goes to go to the bathroom, relieve himself, as the Bible says in my translation, in the cave. Had no idea David was hiding in there. Just picked that cave. 
and David could have killed him. The men say, hey, now's your chance. The Lord's delivered him. And he says, no, I'm going to cut that robe. And we knew that was reminiscent again of the past when uh, Saul ripped Samuel's robe. So this is reminiscent of that. And then, of course, David came right out and showed Saul. It was pretty bold, right? It was pretty bold of him to do. Um, but shows him that he could have killed him, but he didn't. And, and he you know, kind of gets down to the position of, you know, he's in submission essentially to Saul here. And did a really good job, I said, of doing public relations with Saul. And actually got Saul to give a soft word back, which is crazy because he's out there to kill him. He presents himself and Saul, quote unquote, lets him go. But we saw about last week what that really meant. And then, of course, we learned about David and Nabal while they're out there. They were protecting um, the flocks of Nabal, a very rich man from Carmel. And he wanted to get paid. He really just wanted paid in food for his, uh, his men, his 600 men who were protecting them. They did a real service. Like I said, it's probably like security detail. It was very dangerous. Philistines attacked a lot. So it wasn't like David did it for nothing. They, they probably put a lot of effort and energy into protecting them. And Nabal was the foolish, you know, the foolish man. And, you know, Abigail ended up sparing uh, him by stepping in. Remember, this is very Christ-like, which is really interesting because Abigail's a female character. I'm not by any means saying she's Christ, right? But she really represents Christ here because she's stepping in. Abigail is not guilty of anything, but she wants to take the sin of Nabal on herself. And, of course, David's not going to kill her. But she does that, and you can see the story of the gospel just right in there. Um, and Abigail and David end up getting married after... Nabal is struck dead by the Lord. Remember, David was going to kill her, kill him. Abigail says, don't do that. You'll, be, you'll have blood guilt. You'll be guilty of death, of killing, and convinces him not to do that. And then we learn about the patterns. You know, remember Saul said, hey, I'm sorry. I'll never, you know, you're going to be king one day. You're going to do great stuff. And then he goes around and gets full of himself and gets in his head, and he starts pursuing with his 3,000 troops again, 3,000 versus 600. David is very outnumbered. And we learned that David spared him yet again. This time it was a little bit different. David wasn't hiding, and Saul came to him. Saul was sleeping. David went to him. So kind of a flip-reverse kind of a situation here. Um, this time, Abishai uh, came and, and was gonna, he, was, he came with David and was going to kill him with that spear. Remember, that would have been poetic justice. Because remember how this all started? The last thing when, that made David flee was the spear being thrown at him. So it would have been poetic justice if he would have been killed with the spear. But David says no. Very reminiscent, right? Very pattern-like. Tells us very similar things. Here and Saul is spared. And of course, again, a little bit different than the last time, David was right in front of Saul, bowed down to him, kind of. Here he's yelling from afar, right? Now you can see the trust has dwindled because Saul already said he was never going to do this again. Here he is, you know, after David. He knows he's after him because he's heard through the grapevine that this is all going on. And we can look at this and be like, oh, I can't believe Saul's lying to him left and right. But think about how many times, like, you or your kids or us would say, I'm never going to do that again. Like, I promise I'll never do that. It was really wrong of me to do. And then you get, and then your mind just something happens, and over time your mind changes, and then you go right back into that sin. This is kind of what Saul is symbolizing here. He's just going right back into the sinful pride of wanting to chase down his enemy so he can be the one and true king and prevent. He's remember he's really kind of trying to prevent David from being king. He's actually fighting against God, if you could really think of it. Saul knows he told he knows that David's going to be king, but he's still trying to kill him. How if he killed David could David be king? Can't. So there's you can tell there's really a clash of things that are are going on here. And here's the map, and this is actually really nice because we, it goes from 24 to 27. Everything in these chapters is included here. We're going to get to Ziklag tonight, and there's questions of which Ziklag it is here. But you can see again, Gath, where's he, where's where he fled to. Uh, Adjulam is a cave where they were at. Right below there is Kyla where he defended. A little bit more south into the east, and Gedi is the cave where he was hiding in. Um, Ziph and Maon, that's the wilderness. And Carmel, you can see why he ran into Nabal. It was right in Ziph and Maon where the wilderness where he had been. So you can see how it all comes together here. Um, and like I said, Ziklag, remember that? It's kind of the southwest of everything that's going on here. A lot further south of Gath. Um, that's going to come into play tonight. And then Gerzites, Geshurites, Amalekites, Jeremiahites, Kenites, you can see all them. Those are the enemies of Israel. Uh, you can say the people of the Canaanites, essentially, a bunch of different names of the tribes of the Canaanites that uh, God said they should have wiped out um, long ago, and they haven't. And Joshua, remember, that was the whole problem with Joshua. Joshua was thought of as a great leader, but the one thing he failed was a really big one. He never wiped any of these, all these people out. They turned them into slaves instead. And slavery is a sin, the Bible actually says. So they really went against God here. And I make the argument that even today, if you turn on the news, you are seeing this. Like, you're still seeing this stuff happen. By the way, like, just, just a little lesson here. Philistines. Philistines comes from Philistia, right? And Philistines, Palestine, Palestinians. If you can see Palestinians, Philistines, 
very same root word, okay? Now, they're not the exact same people. I don't think they're all descendants of Goliath or anything like that. And, but I'm telling you that archetypes and patterns happen over and over again. And we have the Bible, so we know there will be no peace in Israel until Christ comes back. But I'm here to tell you that I believe what we're reading about today is what you're seeing on the news today. You're seeing another pattern loop, and it will never end until Christ returns. The Philistines have been Israel's enemy since the beginning, and they even are today. And I know that sounds really controversial in, in the place, and I'm not saying that we hate Palestinians, and you know, I'm not saying any of that because they're innocent people involved in all these wars, but you can just see this is what has been going on since the beginning of time, and this pattern continues. And guess where the Palestinians are? Right in Philistia, right where the Philistines are. So that's why I bring this map up. If you, if, what you, if you can understand this and look at this map and see what's going on here in the story of David and Saul and what's first going on in First Samuel, you'll be able to understand what's going on today, too. And by the way, it, like I said, it won't end unless Christ comes back, you know, this year or something. I think it'll, you might get a, you, that's why we get these little waves of peace. Anybody, you know, who's been around since like the Six Day War, 1967 or older, or older people here who knew from the 67 before, you know that these things come and there's these bursts and then everybody, then it calms down and people are going to talk about Middle East peace and then this kind of stuff happens again, so... So you're only going to ever get waves of peace in the Middle East, and that's why it's just a, such a conundrum, and that's why I try not to even have really deep political discussions of people when they want to talk about whose land is what, because it's just never going to end. So it's just complicated, and, and just Christ will settle it later on, is what I tell people. But that's only a little side note, just to kind of tie it in again, because patterns are everywhere, even in our lives today. What happened in the Bible is happening today in other forms, okay? So that's why I really wanted to point that out. So with that said, we're going to jump into chapter 27. It's actually kind of a shorter chapter tonight. It's only 12 verses, but again, a lot is in there. And you've, and you've probably, most of you have probably read this chapter before, but it's not usually one that people kind of jump in and dive into, like Goliath, right? We all sit there and camp out there at some point. You guys have heard Goliath 20 times, and you've heard a bunch of different interpretations and all things like that. But this is one of those chapters, again, not every chapter in the Bible is like that. So you're going to see there's only 12 verses here, but I think it's pretty amazing how much information we can just get out of here by slowing down again on these verses. So as we've been doing, let's go ahead. We're going to read the chapter, 12 verses, and then we're going to back up and start to kind of, you know, unpack what's going on here. So remember, we just ended. I'll just read the last verse. You know, then Saul said to David, blessed be you, my son, David. You will do many things will succeed. So David went his way and Saul returned to his place. So remember, Saul is going back and David left. Now here's where we pick back up. Chapter 27. Then David said in his heart, now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. So David arose and went over, he and the 600 men who were with him, to Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. And David lived with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's widow. And when it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer saw him. Then David said to Achish, If I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be given me in one of the country towns that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So that day Achish gave him Ziklag. Therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. And the number of the days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. Now David and his men went up and made raids against the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites, for these were the inhabitants of the land from of old, as far as Shur, to the <coughs> land of Egypt. And David would strike the land and would leave neither man nor woman alive, but would take away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the garments, and come back to Achish. When Achish asked, where have you made a raid today? David would say, against the Negev of Judah, or against the Negev of the Jeremelites, or against the Negev of the Kenites. And David would leave neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, thinking, lest they should tell about us and say, so David has done. Such was his custom all the while he lived in the country of the Philistines. And Achish trusted David, thinking, he has made himself an utter stench to his people Israel, Therefore, he shall always be my servant. Okay, pretty short chapter, um, but let's break it down. We're going to see a lot of interesting things taking place here. So again, you can, you can now see, if you did it before, why we went back and read about, you know, earlier in chapter 21, how David went to Gath. Because remember last time, we already read it, when he went to see Achish, 
he was pretending to be crazy. He was afraid of Akish, okay? And we're going to go over it. So now we have to look again. This is like, we just saw, you know, Saul come to the cave and David spare him. Then he's sleeping and David spares him. We're going to see a pattern here with a little bit of differences. We're going to see differences this time than we did the first go around, just like we did with the uh, chapter 24 and 26. <clears throat> All right, so then David said in his heart, Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel than I shall escape out of his hand. So the first verse is really loaded, by the way, here. So first off, so the last thing, again, remember the last thing that we read in 1 Samuel 26? Does anybody remember what Saul said to David? What was the last thing Saul said to David? In the end, second, you just go up like a verse. What did Saul tell him? He says, you will do many things and will succeed in them, right? So here you have Saul. The last thing he has in this, before we get to this verse, is Saul says, hey, David, you're right. You're the king. You're going to do some great things. And then we go to the next verse, and David's like, I'm going to die. Saul's going to kill me. It's like, what is going on here, right? Like, what's going on? And it says right here, then David said, it didn't say, then David said to Abishai. Then David said to his men. Then David said to God. Then David said to Akish. It doesn't say that. Then David said in his heart which means David probably didn't say this to anybody, which means, and we all know what it's like to say things in our heart. That means things we don't tell people that we're feeling. We don't tell them what we're going through. It was almost like David's in a deep depression right here, and he didn't tell his people. And he's not doing that. And maybe he's probably one of those guys thinking, I can't look afraid now because I have to lead these 600 men, but in his heart. So you can see David is distressed, even after getting the news from Saul that everything was going to be good, that you're going to accomplish great things, which was true. That was a true prophecy, by the way. But he says, I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. So this goes to show you, first off, David is such a warrior. David has escaped him 16 times. Remember the last time was the 16th attempt on his life? He escaped 16 assassination attempts, essentially. And now he's like, like even as his last one, he's just like, I'm, I'm going to die. And I think what it is, I think this would speak to all of us. Imagine if somebody tried to kill you. Imagine if your neighbor has tried to kill you 16 times. And you've escaped every time. They keep saying, I'm going to stop shooting at your windows. I swear I'll stop this time, right? After some point, like no matter what, it will, it would exhaust you. You'd be stressed out. You're constantly, you can't go to sleep. Like we think about this, by the way. We don't understand because we live in America with locked doors and, and houses with four walls. Back then it was not so. Imagine if you got, we got rid of all of our houses and just had tents. Imagine that. No walls, by the way. And anybody could just walk up at any time to your tent in the middle of the night. It would be a lot scarier. And that's how it was back then. It was not safe. So David probably really never got a good night's sleep. Why? Because, well, Saul could show up in the middle of the night and kill him and all of his men. So I think David, what you're seeing here, David knows he's going to be king. He knows that he's been told that. Saul just confirmed it. So even his enemy's confirming it. He says, you're going to do great things. And immediately, it shows you how immediately, it doesn't matter how much you conquer in life, anybody can be overwhelmed by being almost, this is like, again, like the war of attrition. Again, that whole thing, you know, what he was talking about, how they would hunt partridges in the mountains. It's like a war of attrition. Saul is almost, if Saul heard this, good thing he didn't tell Saul or anybody else and didn't get out word to Saul because Saul would think that he was winning because that was the whole point to just, just run him down, right? And David, it's working actually. David is run down. And just like maybe if you're, you know, your neighbors are trying to kill you, he might move, right? And that's what he's thinking here. He says, there's nothing better for me than I should escape to the land of the Philistines, which is really sad because again, this is the land of the enemy, right? Land of the enemy. So again, think about like current times. This would be like somebody in Israel leading, somebody is fighting Israel, and they go into Gaza. The Gaza and not knowing that they hate Hamas and them hate Israelis, but it's like, you know what, there's no better. Uh, my own people want to kill me. I might as well go move over here to Palestine, right? That is the equivalent. It's like, David, what are you doing, man? Like, you're going to be king over Israel. It's already been told you. He can't kill you if the prophecy stands. God keeps his promises, and you know that. But again, David, one of the, the man after God's own heart, can't even really get over it and keep it together. So it says, So David arose and went over, he and the 600 men who were with them, to Achish the son of Maok, king of Gath. And David lived with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel, and Abigail of Carmel, and Nabal's widow. And when it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer saw him. So this time, so David last time went kind of alone, or maybe you can maximize scripture up to five men at best when he went to Achish the first time. Now he's moving in with 600 men, right? But not only 600 men, because it says every man with his household, right? It's kind of like the feeding of the 5,000. Actually, Jesus fed more than 5,000. It's just 5,000 plus the family, right? So it's like when you start adding women and children, there's more. Same thing here. There's probably thousands of people now in the, in the land of Philistia, in the land of the enemy. 
Um, and it's kind of sad here. This kind of shows you David, king after God's own heart, is going to be the king after God's own heart, right? You can see as a leader, he's, make, he's so panicked right now that he's leading all these people into an idolatrous state because if you remember from earlier in 1 Samuel, the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant. They don't really, and you know, they had all those plagues which was the reason they got rid of it. But they're not very God-oriented. They worship Dagon. Remember, that's the whole thing, the statue of Dagon. So he's taking them, like, could you imagine taking you and your family and all your friends' family and everybody that you lead and you take them to, you know, a Muslim nation where we're going to be mosques or everywhere or some other, you know, Buddhism and you're just like, you, you have the chance of leading your family into that kind of stuff, right? So David here is, unfortunately, although he's a man after his own, God's own heart, this is one of David's, I would argue, one of his worst chapters in the Bible, like of all that he's mentioned. And we'll continue to see. It doesn't get better. It actually gets worse as we go on. So first off, he's now endangered 600 different families to idolatry, right? And I get it. it would, I'm not saying I wouldn't have like freaked out and ran and hid, right? But I'm saying is it, this was a, a bad moment, I think, in David's life. Um, so you got women and children and the 600 men there. Um, but I think that, what do you guys think the difference is here? Because remember last time, David shows up and he's freaked out because they, they positively ID'd him, and he started, you know, putting spit in his beard and scratching. Why do you think, it doesn't even say that David was afraid and approached, you don't even see, by the way, if you notice, like, in the Bible, you always send somebody ahead to do it, and he's been doing this. He doesn't even send anybody ahead to Akish. It doesn't, like, he could have said that, like, and then David sent his men ahead to say, talk to Akish about moving into Phil, uh, Philistia, right? That's how it usually happens, but he doesn't hear. He comp it almost is like he confidently, like, hey, Hey, uh, Keish, I'm going to live here. Is that cool? It's like they were they were buddies about it. Like, why do you guys think this time it went different? So we know the Saul thing went differently. But why do you think, why do you guys think that David wasn't as afraid? He didn't act like a crazy person this time. Does anybody have any guesses? Any guesses? And if you're online, you can guess too. And I'll take a peek at if you type or not. Anybody have any guesses? All right. So let's just break it down and consider it. So when David came, like I said, the scripture gives a maximum of possible five people. So him and a couple people, and he goes to Philistia, where the king is, and all of his army. David was outnumbered then, right? This would be like you, me and a couple of you guys going to the army of Russia and wanting to talk to Putin. Like, you know what I mean? And they find out who we are, and we're Americans. They might be spies. We pretend that we weren't who we were, right? Same kind of thing. But now, David rolls in with thousands of people. Not only that, 600 people. And what have these 600 guys done? Well, they crushed Kyla. Right? They defeated Kyla, and they've kept them safe, and they just they kept Nabal's people safe uh, from the Philistines. So David's not as nervous anymore. Just like, you know, it's like if we walked in with an army and we had tanks and stuff behind us, we wouldn't be as afraid anymore as if we showed up somewhere by ourselves here. So I think the script has been flipped here because now David and his guys have cred. And not only that, the guys are probably more confident. Remember, before they wanted David to pray to make sure they should go to war, and now they've seen what God can do. They're confident, and they're not afraid and David's probably thinking, honestly, if Akish really wants a problem with me, I'm really not afraid, and my guys will wipe him out. Because God's with me, I'm going to be the king of Israel. So he has a very, it's so weird that he has so much confidence, yet he doesn't. Like, it's really, it's really, you can see, and again, I think this is really reflective of us, right? And we can be confident in God's promises, and God says he's going to do what he's going to do. But then we worry about the world's ending, and then what happens, and almost like if God's out of control. So we do the same thing. And, and David's kind of doing it here. Very confident when dealing with the enemy, but not as confident when dealing with the king, who he knows is never going to kill him because he's going to be king later. But again, going through the whole pro process, even though you know the prophecy would have been probably not, not enjoyable, right? All right. And it did work, by the way. And when it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer sought him, right? Um, and this is, you know, pretty easy. If, you, you know, if somebody was after you, your neighbors were after you, and you moved to Wyoming... It would take a lot of money and effort and time to get you, right? It would take a lot of that, so you'd be a little bit safer there. So David was actually kind of wise in a way. He got what he wanted. If he was really afraid of Saul, which I'm sure he was, I would be too, he, he, it was a wise decision. He actually escaped Saul, and we, learned it. we don't ever see Saul track down David again uh, after this. So now we will go into verses 5 through 7 here. Uh, it says, Then David said to Akish, If I have found favor in your eyes... Let a place be given me in one of the country towns that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So that day Akish gave him Ziklag. Therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. And the number of the days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. So, you see here, David goes to Akish says, If I have found favor in your eyes, you know, let a place be given me in the country towns that I may dwell there. 
So what's happening right here, and as we know from the rest of the chapter, David always, he's, he's a really good leader because he's always thinking strategy. He's constantly, I think he's like one of those guys, like kind of like me, just laying in bed like, oh, what can I do about this? How can I, and he's probably constantly thinking about, well, now that we're here, what's the next thing? And because he's asking for a town, David doesn't think he's only going to be there for a little while like he was in May on and Ziff. It's almost like he's like, hey, I need an apartment to stay at here. Kind of like, I'm going to need a place for my people. We're not going anywhere anytime soon. So he has this plan here. Um, and what's interesting, like he says, you know, if I have found favor in your eyes. And then Akish gave him Ziklag, which is that city we learned about, which it says that, you know, basically Israel kept to the day that this was written, which is really interesting. So, like, why? Like, this is crazy. Why would Akish, the king of uh, Gath, the king of the Philistines, give a Jewish Israelite, give this Israelite one of his towns? Is this bizarre to you guys, too? Like, again, just imagine going, like, ima just imagine this. Imagine somebody that defects from Israel, defects right today, and goes over and asks Hamas for a town and say, here's a town in Gaza you could have. Like, what? What's going on here? Right? But it seems to me, and as we go through this text, that Akish actually likes David. Right? Why do you think he likes David? Well, probably because, here, here's one thing, so what, you know, David is, is, not, is confident for one reason that he had 600 men, but another thing I think David was probably not as afraid about, and why Akish is okay with working with him here, is because they, you, you know, it's like, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. I think it's one of those situations. Well, if Saul hates him, and you know, and I hate Saul, maybe this guy will be okay. And again, he knows. Remember when we read that thing? How did how did those how did Akish's guys uh, recognize David? What do they say about David? Like, isn't this the guy they say killed ten thousand people? They said Saul did a thousand. Isn't this the guy that killed ten thousand? So his reputation is well known in Philistia, where he's at. But I think Akish said, hey, I got a warrior here. He's actually come back twice now. That was, I'm, I wonder, I actually wonder, do they talk like, hey, yeah, that was me with the spit on the beard last time. But, you know, I'm, I'm here now. I'm here. You know, I'm like, oh, that was kind of crazy. You could have just told me. You know, it was one of, probably one of those things. I can imagine the conversations they had. But it seems that Akish was buddies with David, which, again, is kind of weird because Akish hates Israel, right? In a way, you could say David somewhat is defected. He has defected from Israel, which is really weird again. Imagine, you know, somebody's set to be the president of the United States and they defect to Russia. Like, what is going on? This is kind of, this is why it's so bizarre what's happening here. But David gets this town of Ziklag. And later on, we're going to see why he asked for this. I think this is a strategy. Ziklag, I'll just actually go back to my map here. See where it's at? See where Gath is up there in the northwest compared to, and Ziklag's all the way down here on the edge, a little bit above Beersheba. By the way, Beersheba, remember from Dan, that's the most north town in Israel, to Beersheba is the most southern. So Ziklag is now down near south of Judah here, uh, but it's far enough away from Gath. So again, just kind of that whole way, like I said, if you move away from your neighbor, they're not going to follow you. Is Akish going to really send guys down here? He think, he trusts David. So David is kind of like, let me live on the edge of town. Let me live on the edge of town here. I don't want to live in your royal city. I don't want to take up your space, your royal space. How about it? And he's so smooth. He's like really good PR guy. He is really good at this convincing people of things. And he's like, I'll just live out of your way down here because why should a servant like me? And he's speaking very respectful to Akish, which is also crazy. And and Akish gives it to him because they're buddies. But this is going to come into his plan um, later that we see. And by the way, here again, just to make note in, in the verse 7 here, the number of days that David lived in the country was a year and four months. So think about that, 16 months, right? So that was a decent amount of time he was there. And again, I think he kind of knew in his heart this is not going to be a one-week camp out. Okay. which is why you wouldn't ask for a town unless you're staying there. But again, it's bizarre, but he does get a town there, which would be in probably modern-day Palestine, which is really interesting. And they even held it, it said, uh, to that day. Now let's go ahead and break down just the rest of the chapter, and you're going to see why he probably did the things here he did, why he asked for Ziklag. So it says in verse 8, Now David and his men went up and made raids against the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites, for these were the inhabitants of the land from of old as far as sure to the land of Egypt. Uh, so, right, so first off, we're going to take a look at here. Geshurites, Gerzites, and Amalekites says these were the inhabitants of the land from of old. Kind of what I said earlier. These are the inhabitants that they should be familiar with because these are the ones that God in Deuteronomy clarifies should be wiped out, the Canaanites, right? And there's a whole deeper thing. You can say, wow, God's so evil. He just want to kill his creation. It's deeper than that. It's a spiritual war. You've got to go back to Babel. And these people are technically with the other gods. It's a whole deep story about this war of Yahweh and the lower, lesser gods. Um, that's But God wanted them to wipe them out because this is the promised land, right? And this is the promised land they're supposed to wipe out. And we already talked about Joshua never did that. 
So in a way here, so what David's doing is now that he's down um, at that place where we saw on the map here, he's right near all these groups. These, and by the way, these are enemies of Israel, right? So it's kind of crazy. He's living on the Philistines' dime, right? He's living in their towns, but he's, he's fighting and killing off uh, Israel's enemies. And you can actually kind of say, well, he's actually just, you know, reading the book of the law, the books of Moses, and doing what God said. He said, hey, there's somebody who didn't clean up the mess, and there's still a mess in aisle five. I'll grab a mop, and I'll clean up, right? So he goes and is, is going to do this. But, but you see here, he's making raids against them. So this is part of his strategy all along because he needs a job, right? He needs a job. He needs food, 600 men plus their families. That's a lot of mouths to feed. I don't know what kind of kitchen they had, but that's got to be a lot of food, right? So he had to have something somehow. So they're making raids against them, right? And let's continue on because you'll get to see here a little bit about how that was. So when David would strike the land and would leave neither man nor woman alive, but would take away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the garments, and come back to Achish. When Achish asked, where have you made a raid today? David would say, oh, against the Negev of Judah, or against the Negev of the Jeremelites, or against the Negev of the Kenites. And David would leave neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, thinking, lest they should tell about us and say, so David has done. So, so what's, what's happening here is the raids are done, again, steal their money. Basically, killing and stealing. So, Again, this is not one of David's strong points. David's job has now, it's David and the bandits now, really. It seriously has become David and the bandits. They might as well be robbing trains out in the West, right? And making the case, well, it was our enemy that we were robbing and killing. So, right? so he's kind of dancing this fine line like, well, if I want to rob anybody, I might as well rob the people that we're supposed to kill. And if I kill them, I'm following God's rules. And who's going to take the stuff so then we can take it? And I'm sure he's justifying this all in his mind. And maybe there's some justification for killing those people. I'm not sure of the Amalekites for sure, because remember uh, Saul's problem? Saul never killed the king of the Amalekites. So David is kind of following up, cleaning up Saul's dirty work. Saul might have not lost his kingship, although it, is, it was always divinely ordained. But perhaps, just like if Moses wouldn't have you know, struck the rock, perhaps if Saul would have killed the Amalekites, wiped them all out like he was supposed to, he would have remained maybe the king. You know, But that's not how, that's not how it goes. So he kills all these people, he raids them, and it's sad. It sounds pretty evil, no man or woman alive. It sounds pretty brutal. And then he steals their sheep, oxen, donkeys, and he brings them back to Akish, right? So Akish loves David, so he let David, heard about he's a warrior, and now Akish is seeing him show up with all these sheep, all this ox, all this gold, basically showing up with money bags. Like, hey, Akish, I'm back today, I went to work. And he showed up with millions of dollars, essentially. So things are working out for David. But when Akish asks him, like, hey, where are you at? It's like, oh, I was down, and I'll basically, tri like, you got to break down all these names up. But basically what, he, Negev, Negev, basically what he's telling them here is like, oh, I was down fighting the Israelites for you. I was out there fighting Saul and his people. And I was wiping them out and I stole their stuff and brought it back, right? So he's lying. So David is straight out lying to the king. So he's using his resources. And the king's probably like, oh, this is great. He's wiping out my enemies. What else do you need? What else do you need? And here he's doing the Lord's work in a way. He's wiping out the Canaanites. So David's kind of a mastermind genius not necessarily sinless, right? Not necessarily the most innocent way to do things. But he is lying. So why does he have to kill the men and the women? It's kind of sad. And in the past, is kind of what they had to do anyway. But it was, um, so it, David would leave neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, thinking what? Lest they should tell about us and say, so David has done. He's actually killing the women and the children and everybody because God forbid somebody gets back to a case and says, he's been, they, he's been wiping us out. David is going to kill you guys next. You know, he's, if he would have found out, could you imagine if Akish would have found out the whole time he was lying, saying, I'm wiping out Israel for you, and he's actually wiping out, he's actually doing Israel's work again, right? It'd be like, again, like if Putin gave us a spot in Russia, and we were starting to fight all the people of America's, like, you know, spot, you know, whoever we wanted to take out or whatever. So it's really crazy. David is kind of a mastermind genius, but again, there's a lot of sin involved, so it's really hard to say, is this a good idea or a bad idea? Well, it was a genius strategy. The strategy definitely worked. But a lot of sin involved because now there's like women dying and all this stuff. All why? So David can live in Philistia with his men? Like why couldn't he live in Israel and trust in God? Probably would have been the better answer. Just stay put. God will deliver you. He's delivered you 16 times. Do you think he's run out of grace? Like, you don't ever see that. God never runs out of mercy and grace when you come back to him, right? So David should have known that deep in his heart. But again, I can't blame him because we are very fickle as humanity as well. But he's lying here and it's more reason why David, why people die because of David's sin. David, again, is a perfect picture of, remember, we had Ahimelech and all of them, the, the priests that Nob die. Now you got women dying, so the people can live in Philistia. Just a lot of evil going on, a lot of sin going on here, and it shows how sin 
can affect people because the Bible doesn't say here, but I'd imagine at least one of the women or children that he brought from his 600 men probably went into idolatry, probably worshipped Dagon, or at least showed up at Dagon's temple once, got invited by their neighbor. So again, David's sin you can see here, this is not one of his best chapters. There's a lot of his sin going on, and it's affecting the people and families uh, around him. And then let's see how it ends here. So David leave another one, or unless I should say, tell us about and say David said it has done. Such was his custom all the while he lived in the country of the Philistines. This went on for a year and four months. Wow. And Achish trusted David, thinking he has made himself an utter stench to his people Israel. Therefore, he shall always be my servant, which is really interesting. And later on, this is going to get him into more trouble. Spoiler alert, you're getting a couple more chapters ahead. And the Philistines are the demise of Saul and Jonathan, by the way. Um, he's going to get later on, if you'll read ahead, and we'll go over it um, another time. But he'll actually uh, get asked to fight against Israel. And that's going to be a mess because David, like, could you imagine a case like, oh, hey, let's go. Now we're going to go fight Israel. Throw your armor on. And you have to tell him, like, no. He'd be like, why? You've been killing them the whole time, right? They're your stench to your people. What that means, and you see this in Genesis, like the stench of the people. Basically, it, it, he thinks that David is so hated in Israel that Saul hates him, that everybody hates him in Israel, that he has a full defect. He is officially defected. And that does happen, by the way, right? You can turn on the news, you can see all this kind of stuff. There's people seeking asylum all over the world today because they defected from their government, stole secrets, they were a contractor, it happened to America, it's happened to other countries, and there's defects that happen all the time. So this is very acceptable to understand, right? That, and, and actually later on, you'll see Abner, he defects to David later on. So defects happen all the time, and he's thinking, wow, you know, David has defected and become a Philistine. This is great, and he'll be my servant forever which is really interesting. And you see David here using his PR. He's really talking honorable to Akish. So he probably has Akish convinced that David is very obedient and he's going to wipe out whoever he wants him to wipe out. And up to this point, Akish hadn't asked him to wipe out anybody. But like I said, later on, this is going to get him in, <laughs> into a hot mess, which, again, which is why lies can just get you into webs and webs and webs and messes. And that's what David uh, will do to him here. But now you can see why I say this chapter is not one of David's strong points. Um, and that's how that, that goes here. Does anybody have any thoughts, questions, or uh, input they'd like to add based on what went on? Yeah, Pastor Brad. Yeah. But just, just a general question, which is the fact that you mentioned and it's on your map that mm -hmm. there was a potential question mark on yeah. which the zigzag it was. What's the reason for that, and what is maybe the ramifications of that? Yeah, that's a really great question. Uh, well, because things that you can see, like Tel El Sherifa and, and Tel El Kuelifa would be the other names for them. So we don't know exactly. It's kind of like in scripture. It's even sometimes trying to pinpoint down who was the Pharaoh when Moses was there. You have some evidence of where it could be, but it's not exactly because obviously they didn't have Google Maps back then. Um, so based on what they're referring to, they believe it is one of these two. And I'm glad he pointed out the question mark. There weren't two Ziklogs there per se, right? He's just saying this, and, and there were, and by the way, that would also get confusing because there sometimes are towns uh, with multiple different names. Uh, however, with that being said, I don't think that is a really great question. Sometimes in the Bible say, well, depending on is it this one or this one, does it matter? I can't find a reason why it would matter so much to our interpretation of which Ziklag is in. Uh, we do know it was in the southwest, um, and it would have been in the Philistines' land. So you can look at Philistia and look at the borders. It would have to be in that area there. Um, but it kind of goes along with like that question they ask in Revelation, like, do you think these are you know all 21 different events, or is it a repeat event? It wouldn't really matter which who's right or not, because if we're not, if we believe we're not going to be here for it, it wouldn't matter anyway. Kind of like here, um, that is a really great point. We're not sure exactly which zik, which where, which one it would have actually been here, but you can determine uh, somewhere in that region there, and that'll happen all the time. The Bible can be very confusing for many reasons, uh, and this is one of them. That there can be multiple names for towns multiple names for people. There's so many Josephs. Um, even, I think, Saul has an Ahinoam, which is different than David's Ahinoam, which gets really confusing when you mention Ahinoam with 1 Samuel, because there's two of them. So, like, it gets really confusing here. So that's a great point and great question. Yeah, Beard. So, the Amalekites, Jeremiahites, and the Kenites, did they have any conflicts with the Philistines? That's a really great question. I'd imagine so. Um, now, it was very probably similar to how it is today, I would imagine. The patterns usually repeat. So, like, if you think of, like, uh, like today, there's Lebanon, there's Syria, and there's Gaza. They might have conflicts, and, and probably because they live more close to so Egypt. I, this would be probably better to say Egypt, because this would be closer to Egypt and Gaza, like, today. I'm sure they have their spouse, just like 
even siblings can kind of bump elbows here. And I'm sure there were wars. There are wars off and on between them. But I, I, I would imagine probably their main enemy, kind of like today, was Israel. Because like uh, the Arab people that live in the Middle East today, these would have thought the same thing. Like, hey, we were here first. You guys are the aggressors. You'll heard this term a lot. You guys are the aggressors here. We were living here, and now you make these settlements here. You've made these settlements in Car, you know, in Zikla and all this stuff. Like, you got to get out of here. This is our land. So I would think Israel would have been the prime uh, enemy, and spiritually so. The spirits would have done that anyway. But that's a great question. I would imagine it doesn't really. I mean, we could probably go throughout there. There's probably somewhere in Scripture where the Amalekites and the and they get in a war or something like that, because there is a lot of activity when when kings are teaming up there. Um, but I would say, just off the top of my head, I'd imagine there were skirmishes, but I don't think there was all-out war like there was with Israel. Very similar today. Uh, like Yemen and Oman, like they're warring today, and there will be wars over the Middle East today, and there's things going on, uh, but Israel's one of the biggest enemies. But that's a really good question as well. Any other uh, thoughts, comments, or questions on any of that? Hmm? Hello, Paul. Oh. David really didn't have to run anywhere, right? Correct. And that's and that's the most mind-blowing thing, because you, like right there, I wish, Paul, I wish you would have been back there in 1000 BC and said, David, stay put. You're going to take all these families into idolatry. You, you just escaped 16 assassination attempts. Stay there, God said. And you could have listed all the prophecies. Like, remember Saul told you this? And Samuel told you that? And you've escaped. God has delivered you in miraculous ways. You were almost could have killed Saul twice and you didn't. So, it's bizarre, isn't it, Paul? Like, what is he doing? But it show, it goes to show how anxiety and fear and depression can get in the greatest minds of all time. Because I would think David is one of the greatest kings, but also probably one of the most strategic, or, uh, strategic g generals of all time. Because he's the one that fought to get Ziklag, which is genius. And if he would have been fighting from Gath, every time they, Kath, or Gath, every time they came back, there would have been a lot of going on. So he hid on the edge of town. But you're right. Yeah, I don't think there was any reason that he had to flee, which is a really good point here because we can use a lot of Pauls in our life, even ourselves, right? We can look at ourselves just like Dane was going through and saying, hey, you don't have to do that. Didn't God say in his word this, this, and this? And a lot of times it might snap us out of it like, oh, you know, you're, it happens to me like, oh, yeah, you're right. I shouldn't really worry about that because of this and this. So it goes to show that even the best of the best minds can have anxiety over them so much they're not even thinking straight and remembering because that's, that's why I think it's fascinating is that the last thing we read in chapter 26 is that Saul says, I'm going to leave you alone. You're going to do great stuff. And the first thing David, we see, we don't know how long of a gap of time there is, but it almost looks as if David's like, I got to run. Like, it's not the message you just heard. So panic and fear. And guess what? I think it probably has a lot to do with spiritual attacks. We got to talk about the spiritual realm. I know we're in angelology in the mornings when I do Sunday school, but we got to take the spirit seriously because it's really hard to understand what's going on in the Bible if you negate the spiritual realm, right? So I think there's also our flesh is one of probably our top enemy because Satan doesn't follow us around every day and there's a demon that doesn't follow us around every day. They can interact with us, but our flesh follows us around every day, right? So we are an enemy and then so are the spirits. And sometimes they, they team up with us to attack us, right? So I can imagine David's flesh, he's tired, he's hungry, he wants to go sleep in his own bed. He wants to go to sleep at night without being worried you know, about being killed. So he's like thinking all these things and then you probably have these spirits. And remember, he was in spiritual warfare back when he met Saul. He was actually in a spiritual war chasing off a spirit. He was playing music, but that was actually, in a crazy way, you consider a spiritual attack on that spirit, and the spirit had to leave. So I'd imagine those spirits don't like David either, just like Saul. And I think they're probably the ones that are stirring up Saul's mind the same way, because you see Saul acting like David. Hey, I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. Hey, I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. And it's like, what is going on? I think these spirits, they're invisible, and they don't, they don't come up in Scripture all the time, but I think... Just like you can see the fingerprints of God on things, you can sometimes see the fingerprints of the spiritual war on things. And I bet you there was even spirits, you know, giving anxiety and encouraging these kind of thoughts to David to make him go to the Philistines. And perhaps the evil spirits would have thought, maybe we'll get him to worship Dagon. Maybe he gave up completely on Israel. He doesn't think anything's good for Israel. Maybe we'll get him to worship our our spirits for a while. So that's a great that's a great point and a great question, Paul. Any other uh, thoughts or questions or comments? I never thought about it until tonight, but Samson like took down the Temple of Dagon, so at some point it, they got around to rebuilding it. Apparently. Yeah, yeah, which is which is really interesting. Yeah, and it's kind of like, and that's a really good point. It's very similar to you can even say the Jews because their temple got destroyed and then it got rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt. And go back to the spirit realm. 
they would believe Dagon was still there, even if the temple wasn't, so they had to get it right back up and running. But you're so right, which is really interesting, these patterns again. Because Samson, again, who that, he's fighting, if you see the Philistines are over and over and over again. That was back in the book of Judges, chapters like 14 through, I don't know, like 18 or something like that. So the, it's, you can see there, too, the fact that they rebuilt their temple, just like Israel, I believe, will re rebuild their third temple. They had to rebuild it over and over, and Zerubbabel had to come and all that stuff. Yeah, it's really fascinating to think, just like Israel was very focused on their temple, so were the Philistines. Um, and that's why I love even an earlier in Samuel, because they do have the temple there, and that God like makes the Dagon temple go over and smashes its hands and its face off. It's really, really cool. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah, Pastor Brad. Um, just, this is jumping a little bit ahead. Mm -hmm. um, when we get to the time period of like 2 Samuel 7, um, when David is, you know, possessing this desire to build the temple, uh, do you believe that this chapter, 1 Samuel 27, is one of the reasons why he wasn't allowed to build the temple? Since, as it says, you know, mm -hmm. God tells him, like, hey, you're not going to do that because you shed a lot of blood in your hands. Do you think that this is kind of one of the parts where that's referring to? That's a really great question. I, it's probably an all-encompassing thing. Um, although the scripture does always seem to, like, Kind of like Saul, like for example, Saul screws up a lot. And we pin it, it's pinned on the fact that he didn't kill Agog, the king of the Amalekites. But there's many other reasons Saul was probably a failure anyway, with all these other things. Um, so I bet you it had a lot to do with what David was doing. But I think this very well could have been one of the main reasons. Because you see, what is he, he essentially builds a town, but instead of doing it for God and waiting it to do it for God, he builds one here in Philistia, which is kind of a temporary dwelling place. And then, like you said, he's going here and killing. It's kind of tricky because technically, again, they are Canaanites, but I think David went around about it uh, the wrong way. So this could definitely, we don't know for sure, but this could definitely play a big part in that. For those of you who don't know, we're jumping ahead to 2 Samuel. David was the one who wanted to build the temple, but God prevent, literally prevented him from doing that. So he had to gather all the stuff for Solomon. That's why it's called Solomon's temple. But David really had the original desire. Uh, to build that and God prevents them. We see that over and over, like I was mentioning, how Saul gets stripped of the kinghood. Even Moses couldn't go into the promised land. So very very similar. David can't go, can't build the temple. Moses can't go into the promised land. You can see these kind of patterns of very what you consider the holy people of the Bible failing in some way that they couldn't even do these big tasks that I bet you if David said my one dream thing I could do my whole life is to build the temple of God, and that was the one thing he didn't get to do. I bet you talk to Moses, hey, the one thing I would have loved to do, I didn't care about all the gold I had in Egypt and the Pharaoh thing. I would have just loved to see the promised land, and he missed out on it. So it can show, I think, how our sins can hinder us sometimes from receiving the full blessings of God, at least on this earth. It won't prevent anything in the future, because Christ has always already done all that, right? So you can't, you know, it, it, that, that said and done, our salvation said and done. But I think here, your disobedience to the Lord can affect what's happening on earth here for, for what it's worth. So, any other? These are great. Any other comments oh, or questions? Yeah. Uh, the beginning of 27, he didn't ask God. No, correct. What he should do. He said, oh, gee, I think I'm going to flee and bring my men. Yep, correct. And, and like he says, in his heart, he didn't even say, hey, Abishai, come over here. You're with me. You're one of my mighty guys. Hey, come over here. What do you think we should do? He, did, he, he took it upon himself in his heart. And we do that a lot ourselves. Um, you know, we do things, and, and by the way, it could be really good, like this is a bad example that David got ahead of himself, but it could have been like, you know, think about this. David could have said, hey, you know what? I'll build a temple, and I'm gonna build a temple for God. This will be a really good thing. Not ask God, it would have been a really bad thing, right? So sometimes you can say, hey, you know, hey, this person's asking for me to do this, and it's a Christian thing, so I think I should really do this. And you have no idea. God has something really big for you, bigger things over here, and you're not asking them. And you're going to, and there's, a, I tell people this all the time. I had to learn this fact. There's a billion things that you could do to help people today. All good things. All good things to help people. But God does not have you out to do all billion. God has called you to do specific things in your life. So when you say yes to things that aren't meant for you, but they're good and they still look good on the surface, you could be saying no to what God had prepared for you here. So that's a really good lesson to us here. Uh, we know Joshua and Joshua 9 makes the same mistake. He didn't ask. That's why the Gibeonites fooled him with all the tattered clothing. They did a good job and they fooled him. They would not have fooled Joshua had he had prayed, right? It's a really good reminder to us and we all need it because again, like I said, it can almost seem like a no-brainer. Like, hey, will you volunteer and do this? Like, yeah, sure. And it's like, hey, I should actually ask God. And a lot of times God's going to say, yeah, you should, right? A lot of times, yeah, you should volunteer. You should help where you can, right? But I'm sure you guys have run into a thing where somebody says, hey, can you do this? And somebody says, hey, can you do this? And they're the same date. And they're like two hours apart, but they're three towns apart. And you're like, uh, I'll try to do both. God doesn't want you to do both a lot of times. 
but we want to do both. We don't want to let anybody down. So this is just a good lesson to us that we should always go to the Lord in prayer because we just listed a bunch of people, Joshua and David. These are some big names that forgot to pray. So I'm sure you have, I have on big things. So make sure you're praying to the Lord to verify. And like I said, yeah, not only talking to your heart because you can get lost in your own mind. Yeah. And the other thing, um, when you were talking, if you take it to the Lord in prayer, mm -hmm. he's going to give you the right answer. But even the most respected person sitting ne like next to you, I trust Mel, right. but she doesn't know always what God has for me. So She's pretty smart. She is. <laughs> <laughs> Don't discount Mel. She's pretty good. <laughs> well, I am. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. No, that is true, though. That is true. And that's why, uh, really good example. I can't go into details of people. I was doing a counseling session this weekend. And somebody went, and I had been counseling this person for, like, months in a situation. And they had other people they were going to. And they was this one person who really loved and cared about them. And they gave them the complete opposite advice I had been giving them for six months. And they did it out of a good heart. But it was one of those things they gave them this advice, hoping they'd achieve this really good, what this person really wants out of it. Kind of like here, hey, what, like, almost like asking yourself, hey, I'd really like if God says this. So you start asking people until somebody tells you, right? And that's what false prophets are. You see that in the Old Testament all the time. The, the, you know, the real prophet's going to get his head chopped off, but the false ones will say whatever they want to hear to make them feel really good. So you can have bad counselors, just like there are false prophets. And even some of the best people, like that was a really good example of Mel. Like I don't think Mel would ever steal you wrong, and she knows her Bible really well. But none of us know what God has in the future. The future is a sea of uncertainty, they say. Not, none of us know what will happen after we leave these doors. So how could I tell you what's best for you? Only God could. I can tell you what I think would be a really good idea. I think you should do more of the Lord's work and less of worldly things. I can tell you all that stuff. But to give you specifics even to say, hey, you should do this for VBS, or you should go help this church with that. I don't know what's best for you. You should probably pray about it. I might be right, but I'm only giving you advice that I know with my limited consciousness right here. So it's always good to get godly advice from your Christian friends. They're going to give you Christian advice. And a lot of times they're probably right, but sometimes something's going to happen in your heart and say, yeah, I know that sounds really good. I know those people need it. Uh, but maybe we should pray. The Lord's not really calling me that. We need to pray, uh, you know, for that situation to get resolved. But I think I'm supposed to be doing this, this, and this, right? Um, so that is a really good point. It is very good to talk to other Christians and get their counsel. Uh, be careful not to go to the world. That can also happen, uh, which I think this person did. The person that went and got advice went to somebody that wasn't necessarily a Christian. So that always makes it even more difficult because worldviews are very important when you're giving counseling advice, right? Because the world, there is secular people that get good mental health advice, but it's never from a biblical worldview, so there's always something off-kilter with it. It's usually about you can do and all kinds of things, but that is another lesson. Always pray to God, because that's the solution. Just pray to God, and you get the answer. And God can deliver the message you know, through other people. They can encourage you, hey, I heard about this opportunity. You might have been praying for an opportunity to serve more that you don't feel like you feel the need to serve more, and somebody might bring you these things, but always pray about them, and I don't think it's a sin. Because remember, David actually did the right thing in Kyla. Remember, he prayed, said, hey, should we go do it? And God's like, yeah, you should go do it. And his men are scared, like, hey, we're scared. And he's like, hey, I'll ask God again for you. And he did it, and they won, right? So, but there's a wrong way to go about things, and it can look right for a while. Um, just like Joshua, the perfect example, go back and read Joshua 9 if you have it in detail, and it seems like Joshua's doing a really good thing. People show up in tattered clothes, they barely have stale bread, and they're so hungry, they're just traveling. That seems like the Christian thing to do. Let them in, they're straight, let them in, show them hospitality, they might be an angel. Give them food. Give them clothes. And he didn't ask. They were the enemies. They're not supposed to be living with them. So a good example that even things that look like you're doing the right thing can be the wrong thing if God has a different plan. So that's a deep one, but it's true. Uh, any other questions or comments? All right, with that said, we are going to take, I just want to let you guys know, we will take a two-week break. Next week we have VBS, and then the following week we'll have a fellowship meal. So we'll be back, I think, in August. It'll probably be the first Sunday in August, whatever that date happens to be and we'll be in uh first samuel 28 one of the juiciest chapters of first samuel we get into witchcraft and mediums and so it's gonna be really fun the witch of endor so go ahead and read ahead for that um and i'll see you then lord willing thank you